All right. Okay. So um, it is uh, week five, and uh, and we're going to introduce markup chains. Okay. So this is exciting. I think. <laughs> All right. So um, you know we we saw um, just kind of to step back, look at the big picture for a moment. So in the uh, in the context of Bayesian statistics. Um, we find that you know we often want to find the expectation, expected value of some kind of function, right? And we said you know we often have the expected value of h of x, you know, assuming x comes from the distribution f. And so, um, and this this is usually some kind of integral where you take the uh, the function h of x multiplied by f of x, and sometimes solving that integral is um, directly is a little bit too hard. And so we can estimate it using Monte Carlo estimation. And the way we would estimate it is we just generate a whole bunch of random values, random values of x generated by uh, this PDF f, okay, or or PMF, the uh, the function f. So we generate a bunch of x values, and then we just plug them in to h of x and take the mean. And that works for uh, for estimating, okay. And then so um, so after we covered that, we said, well, um, you know, if you're not able to generate random values of x from r because r's got a built-in function, then we have a few methods for generating random values. So we looked at methods like the inverse CDF, making convolutions, and um, rejection sampling. And, and that's what um, your homework three is all about is generating random values. And um, so uh, just a quick discussion of these, inverse CDF is effective and efficient, but it requires you to find the CDF and the inverse CDF, um, which might not be possible, okay? And rejection sampling doesn't require figuring out that inverse CDF, but it can end up being inefficient, um, which, which can present kind of a, another set of problems. So, um, so just consider this, this example, right? So let's say we wanted to generate values from the T distribution. Um, T distribution with three degrees of freedom. And um, so, you know, we can generate values from the uh, normal distribution by kind of like folding it in half and then use rejection sampling with the, um, by generating values from the exponential distribution. And so um, here, we can generate values from the t distribution, okay? And with the t distribution, we can do something similar. We will fold it in half, and then um, um, and then this will be the PDF, okay? So this is the PDF of the t distribution with three degrees of freedom, and uh, and then it's going to be twice as tall, but it's only going to apply to the positive side, and then. Um, and we can try to use the exponential distribution uh, as a proposal distribution, right? Because we say, well, you know, if you say, well, what does the t distribution looks like? Lo what does it look like? You'd say it looks a lot like the normal distribution, okay? And so this worked for the normal distribution rejection sampling. But what, if we try to do this, what we're going to find is that um, that we're going to run into some problems, okay? So, you know, this proposal distribution has the same support and this distribution has the same support. So our design should work, okay? Um, so here, here's the issue is that with rejection sampling, you have to find a value M so that M times G of X is gonna be greater than F of X for all the problems, okay? And, um, and we do this by finding the maximum of F of X divided by G of X, all right? And, and we run into a problem, okay? So the desired distribution, this, if you kind of, we see three plus x squared squared. So you're gonna have basically a polynomial of degree x to the fourth, right? So you have a, an x to the fourth term in the denominator, okay? Whereas g of x, you can think of this as one over e to the x, okay? one over e to the x. And so that, that's gonna, um, 
G of X is going to decay much faster. It, it shrinks at a much faster rate than um, X to the fourth. Okay. And so in this case, F of X, you know, is said to be heavy tailed. Okay. And so, um, so, so one issue is that no matter how big of an M that you pick, eventually as X gets bigger and bigger and bigger, M G of X will end up being less than F of X, which is, which is the opposite of what we want. We want, we want M G of X to always be greater than or equal to F of X for all, for all X. Okay. So let me just kind of show you, this is, this is F of X in red, and this is G of X in orange. And what I can do is I can multiply g of x by some constant. Okay, so for the um, folded normal distribution, we would multiply it by something like 1.32. Here I'm going to just <coughs> multiply it by 1.5. Okay, and we could see that okay, m times g of x in blue is taller than f of x, so that looks good. But if we look over here, if I zoom in to this region five five through eight, okay, if I zoom in to this little window we see that mg of x ends up crossing f of x, okay, around 5.5, right? So we say, okay, well, what if I pick a bigger constant? What if I pick a constant like two, okay? And so with m times g of x in blue, okay, it's, it's even taller and you can see the relative height of f of x in red gets short, right? So, so in the beginning, f of x and g of x were you know, this was the relative height. And as I make mg of x taller, the, this, the scale just keeps getting bigger and bigger, right? So, so here f of x gets shorter, and then here f of x is even shorter. But again, if I zoom in over here, we see that mg of x and f of x cross, f of x ends up still being taller with, with m equal to two. So I could say, well, what if I try <laughs> I'm just going to keep pushing it. I'm going to try m equal to six, okay? And so now m times g of x is even is even taller, and f of x, which this whole time has remained the same height, but just because my vertical scale has has changed, looks even shorter, okay? And again, if I zoom in further out, so no longer around five, but now if I zoom further out uh, and zoom in over in this region, again it crosses this time. Uh, around eight and a half. Okay. And so, you know, I could say, well, what if I choose m equal to 60? Okay. m equal to 60, then um, m times g of x is super tall. f of x, you know, you can barely recognize any structure here, but, you know, it's just barely not flat over here. But I mean, it, it has remained the same height the, the whole time. It's just our vertical scale is now way taller because. I'm doing 60 times g of x. This is super tall. And the lines don't cross until x is greater than 12. But if you go out to x is 12, they still cross. OK. So, so this is an issue with having um, a heavier tail, is that um, no matter how big of an m you choose, eventually f of x is going to end up being greater than m times g of x. I went up to m equal to 60, but you know you could pick m equal to 6,000, and you'd still run to this issue. It probably won't be until you know x is like 100 or something, but um, but, but it's a it's an issue, okay? And so you know we could say, well, you know what this this is pretty good, okay? Because if, if we look at the this distribution, you're telling me it's not going to cross until we get to 12. And I'd say, well, I mean, how often am I going to get a number bigger than 12 anyway? So, so you could argue, you could say that, you know, with a big value, okay, um, re the rejection sampling algorithm will, will be accurate as long as this statement is true, right? So the rejection sampling algorithm is, is accurate where m times g of x is greater than f of x. And it's just that when this is no longer true, it's, it's not producing values um, at the appropriate rate. So, you know, in the case, if I use m equal to 60, then, then this is true 
you know, as long as X is less than something around 12.275, okay, 12.274. And so this is gonna be a accurate for approximately 99% uh, of the values, over 99% of values. And so, um, so, you know, one could argue like this is good, okay? But if, if we do decide to implement this, this solution, which, which is still a compromise, right? It's, it's not accurate for all of X, it's only accurate for X less than 12. Um, if we do decide to implement <clears throat> kind of this compromise solution, our algorithm ends up being very inefficient, right? We're using M equal to 60. And so our acceptance rate, you know, is only gonna be expected to be around one divided by 60, okay? Does that make sense? Using using an M that's super huge. I mean, if you just think of like, remember when we would show, um, um, if I go back a couple of slides, I don't remember which which slide it was, but if you know, if we look at rejection sampling and we look at, um, you know, an image like this where you have the blue and the the dots over here. If you imagine something like that here, you know, pretty much everything that's over the red line, okay, anything that's above the red line but below the blue line is going to get rejected. And it's only dots that fall under the red line that get accepted. And if I just threw a whole bunch of dots underneath the blue line, we're, we can imagine like the vast majority are going to get rejected, okay? Only, only a small sliver that falls underneath the red line are going to get accepted. And, and so here, anyway, but I tried it, right? I tried it anyway. And I say, all right, I'm gonna set M equal to 60. Um, the function that I wanna accept is gonna be twice as tall as the T distribution, two times DT. And then, um, and then we're gonna generate from the exponential distribution. So my proposed X comes from the, uh, is random exponential. Um, we're gonna accept based on a random U. I calculate the, uh, ratio, which is F divided by M times G of X. And I'm going to accept whenever U is less than R and, it, and then, um, and I subset the proposed values based on whether I've accepted. Okay. And so I can say, well, how many values did I accept versus how many values did I propose? And I proposed a hundred thousand, 10 to the five. Okay. And so, um, we only accept 1,609 out of 100,000. Okay, so I, I, I proposed 100,000 and I accept, you know, 1,600. Okay, so I'm, I'm accepting only around 1.6%, which, which to me sounds pretty low, okay? Um, but if I just decide to stick with it, this is, this is what we would do, right? So. Um, if we want to get go from folded T distribution to regular T distribution, what we can do is just we can assign a positive or negative sign to all of the values in the folded T. So the folded T only generates positive values, and I can just randomly assign some values to be positive and some values to be negative. Okay, And so I'm going to just sample 1 and negative 1 with replacement. Okay, And, and then I'm going to take my accepted values of x multiply it by the sign, and these are gonna be my random T values. And if I create a plot of the random T, yeah, that looks like the T distribution, okay? And then if I run it through the KS test and I say, okay, how do my random T values compare to the um, um, CDF of the T distribution with three degrees of freedom? It says, okay, yeah, your P value ends up around 0.7, okay? And so that seems to pass the KS test and that it, we have no reason to doubt that it's not coming from the T distribution, okay? But again, there's a lot of, <laughs> a lot of problems, right? So the pro, like an argument for this system is that, yeah, it does seem to produce a sample that looks like it came from the T distribution. So that's good, okay? But an argument against it, the con is that we're only accepting around 1.6% of proposed values, which, which sounds very inefficient to me. And, you know, 
the algorithm also won't produce the correct amount of values of x for when x is greater than 12.2, right? Because that's where f of x and mg of x cross, and mg of x ends up being uh, lower than f of x. Okay, and so that, that's a problem. Um, so there are better solutions. I mean, R, R obviously has a built-in random t distribution function, um, and you would use that. And um, you know, there is a there's a version of the box Mueller transform that can be applied to the t distribution, um, and you can read about that here. Um, but we're just going to kind of leave it at that. Uh, and I'm going to just say, you know, this is just like a mini example. But um, you know, there's a lot of other examples that kind of fit this uh, setup or this ha have the same issue in that um, you know, maybe you don't have an elegant transformation solution like the box Mueller transform for the T distribution. Um, but you know, the, the regular methods like rejection sampling can end up being very efficient, uh, uh, very inefficient, okay? And and this problem is often exacerbated in higher dimensions. Okay, so in higher dimensions, um, rejection sampling will end up being uh, like super inefficient, and a whole bunch of other methods also just just have a hard time. And so, in these cases, a lot of these cases, um, we want to do Markov chain Monte Carlo. And <clears throat> uh, and and Markov chain Monte Carlo can can produce Kind of the samples that you want. Okay, um, so what MCMC will do um, is it's going to create correlated samples. Okay, whereas all of these other methods from before produced independent samples, and um, and MCMC will is creating a, a chain where the next value depends on the current value. So the values are going to have kind of a link to each other, and they're going to be correlated. Um, and they will, uh, but they'll come from the desired target distribution, okay? You know, eventually, and um, uh, as long as, I guess, your chain runs long enough and stuff. Okay, so so before we get there, I'm going to just kind of talk about, like, Markov chain scenarios first, mm -hmm. and, then, and then we can talk about um, properties of Markov chains and get there. So I'm going to kind of just introduce stuff. Have, have you guys encountered Markov chains before in other classes or anything like that? Not really. Maybe. Okay. All right. So anyway, this is our introduction. Okay. So we're going to be dealing with what's called discrete time Markov chains. Okay. And, uh, and discrete time means um, it's, it's kind of like a, uh, um, steps take happen at different intervals. It's it's kind of like um, um, you got you're taking turns in a board game or something, right? So at time one, this is the state. At time two, this is the state. At time three, this is the state. At time four, this is the state. So on and so forth. Versus um, the 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 opposite would be a continuous time Markov chain where time is a continuous variable and stuff like that. Okay. So anyway, so discrete time Markov chain where x, x of t, so this is basically x of t, where time takes on the values 1, 2, 3, so on and so forth, is a stochastic process, OK? And a stochastic process basically means what you're going to do is you're going to get a sequence of random variables, OK? So it's a stochastic process that satisfy the Markov property. OK, and the Markov property is this, is that x at time n plus 1, OK? So the probability that x at time n plus 1 equals some value j, OK, given everything else, all the states that came before it, x at time 0, x at time 2, x at time, or time 1, time 2, time 3, all the way up to x at time n minus 1 and x at time n, OK? So all, all the values up to here can be simplified to just x at time n plus 1 equals j only depends on x at time n, OK? So, so everything that happened before doesn't really matter. The only, 
the only thing that matters for the next value, x at time n plus 1, depends only on kind of our current value, x at time n. Only, only the previous one matters. So once you get to here, whatever happened in the past, that was in the past, OK? What happens tomorrow only depends on today. It's basically the philosophy of the Markov chain. All right. Um, you have something called the state space. The state space is all the possible values uh, for e, for x. Okay, x at every single possible time is basically all the possible values. Okay, and so that Markov property. Uh, you know, another way to state it is that basically the probability that the chain moves to the next state, state J. Okay for the next step depends only on the current state, okay? And the current state is state i, okay? And it doesn't matter on um, where the chain has been or what, what values it has taken um, earlier, okay? So sometimes this is called the memoryless property in that, again, what happens tomorrow, what happens in the next step depends only on where you are right now, okay? So whatever events happened in your past, it, it doesn't matter, it's just where are you today and what are you going to do? And where will that lead for tomorrow? Um, and so um, that's it. OK. And we're, we're going to look at um, countable or finite states, state spaces, which we call discrete state, discrete time Markov chains. OK. <laughs> so um, so we're, looking, we're dealing with discrete time Markov chains, and then um, the states that we can that the Markov chain can take on right now um, are, are going to be countable states, OK? As in, like, I can list them off. I can create a table. We're going to create a transition matrix here. All right, and, um, and so we can write the state space as 0, 1, 2, dot, 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 or 0, 1, 2, dot, 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 to, um, to n, OK? And that these are countable, and this is countable and finite, OK? So, um, so we, we can deal with this situation where technically the values, the state space could go up to positive infinity or negative infinity, but only like dealing with countable like integers, right? All right, I know this is a lot of kind of um, a little bit more technical speak. Uh, I think with a few examples, this will be better, okay? All right, and then so when we're dealing with this kind of setup where we have like a countable number of states and uh, and the state space itself, the, the state space is countable and we're dealing with kind of discrete time, we can create what's called um, transition probabilities for all of the states, okay? And, and basically we, we wanna know the probability of ij, okay? And the probability ij means if you are currently at i, what's the probability you'll end up at j? Okay, it's a transition probability of going from state i to state j. Okay, so if you are currently, I guess you can think of like people moving from one location to another. So if you're currently living in California, what's the probability that next year? you are living in Texas, okay? And J could be Texas or something or or something like that, right? So let's say let's say you want let's say some people will move from this year to next year, okay? We'll move from one state to another. So we'll we'll just limit ourselves to the uh, 50 states in the in the US and so we'll say if you're currently in California, what's the probability you end up in Texas? Or if you're currently in California, what's the probability you end up in New York? Or if you're currently in California, what's the probability you end up in Alaska next year or something like that, right? And then, you know, we, we can sw swap this up and we can say if you if somebody currently lives in Illinois, what's the probability they end up in Florida or something like that, okay? And so, so how many transition probabilities would exist total for the 50 states? You, you'd have a square matrix, right? You would have 50 for, to represent all of the possible locations where you currently are, and it would be 50 by 50 to represent all of the locations where you could end up next year, right? So you'd have 
um, it would be uh, from uh, it would be a 50 by 50 and it would be kind of from where you are currently to where you are so that I mean that's like a literal <laughs> state but um, it, you know so this is this is how you would end up building your transition matrix okay so your transition matrix is big P here and and it goes, you know, in the top left, you go from state zero to state zero. So this is, so you can remain at the next step, right? Like if you're in California now, next year, you can end up in California. That's probably going to be the highest, like the diagonals in, the, in this moving from one state to another is probably the tallest because in general, going from one year to the next year, most people don't, don't move from one state to another. So probably the diagonal elements are going to be the largest values. But, you know, if this... I guess if we go alphabetically, this would be Alabama or something. Okay, so this would be you know the probability of going stay, uh, being in Alabama now, ending up in Alabama next year, Alabama, Alaska. Okay, so moving from Alabama to Alaska, I guess some people will do that transition. Probably not a lot. Okay, moving from Alabama to Arizona, and then so on and so forth, all the way down to starting in Alabama and moving to Wyoming and things like that. Okay. I don't know. I don't know anything about Alabama and where people would move. I imagine the adjacent states would have. So most people in this made up scenario, I imagine the diagonals will be the largest number. Most people stay put and then moving to an adjacent state will probably be um, high values. So what's next to Alabama, Mississippi and on the other side is Georgia. No. Yes. I don't know. Florida on one side. Okay. And then, um, and then, you know, probably large pop population centers like California, New York, um, and, and Texas will generally be large in all of these things. Okay. Um, and so anyway, uh, because there are transition probabilities, everything has to be non-negative. You can't have any negative values. And then well, obviously you can't have anything larger than one e either, right? So all the entries. Uh, and then this represents basically everywhere you can go based on your current state. And so the sum of each row is gonna add up to one. Okay, so that's also a requirement, right? So the sum of the row, everything has to add up to one because if you're currently in Alabama, you've got to end up somewhere, whether it's at, in Alabama or another state, you got to end up somewhere. So. Um, this represents basically everywhere you can go based on your current location or your current state. And so, um, so everything in the row has to add up to one. Okay, so this is, <laughs> forgive my drawing here, but um, this is the transition state diagram, okay? So, so here is a transition state diagram with two possible states, okay? We've got state A and we've got state B, okay? And from state A, you can either end up back at state A or you can switch to state B, okay? And then if you're at state B, you can end up back at state B or you can end up at state A, okay? So if you have two states, your matrix, your probability matrix will be a two by two. You've got four values and those are represented with these four arrows here, okay? You've got one, two, three and four, okay? And so, you know, this is, I guess in California or whatever, A could represent sunny weather and B could represent not sunny weather, like cloudy or rain or something, okay? And so if it's sunny today, it could still be sunny tomorrow or it could end up being cloudy tomorrow, okay? And if it's cloudy today, it could be cloudy tomorrow or it could switch back and become sunny tomorrow. And so, if you can fill out your matrix like this, okay? And, and then the corresponding diagram would look like this, okay? So this would be, um, so if this is row A on top and row B in the, the, the bottom and then column A over on the left and column B on the right, okay? So 0.7 would be from A going back to A and you have a 0.3 going from A to B. So this adds up to one, okay? And then 0.4 represents uh, going from B over to A, right? So this is state B, column A, current row B, 
um, 0.4 to A, and then uh, over here is 0.6, and that's starting in B going back to B, okay? So we have that, right? So this says if it's sunny today, there's a 70% probability of being sunny tomorrow, and there's a 30% chance that it won't be sunny, okay? Going to state B. And if it's not sunny today, there's a 40% probability it will be sunny, um, sunny tomorrow, and a 60% chance that it won't be. And we see that the rows, the, the rows add up to one. And then if you look at each node, the arrows originating from each node um, add up to one, right? 0.7 to 0.3 and 0.4 and 0.6. Okay. So there's nothing that says that when you look at the nodes going into it, uh, the arrows going into a node have to add up to one, right? So this one is 0.3 ends up at B and 0.6 ends up at B. That's fine. It doesn't add up to one. Okay. It's just from one node, the arrows that leave the node, those have to add up to one, okay? Because that's what we've got here. In the row, the, uh, the rows represent the arrows that kind of leave, they have to add up to one. All right, is this okay? So this is just kind of like a basic, um, uh, basic, basic Markov chain. All right, so I, uh, we'll just take a look at a couple other examples of Markov chains, and then, um, and that'll, probably be it for today's lecture. Okay, so this, um, we've got the Aaron Fest urn model. Okay, and this is like a, a, a mathematical model for like the diffusion of molecules through like a membrane or something, right? So um, it's kind of just like, <laughs> um, if you've got, um, like if you put some stinky food in the fridge, even if it's like in a Tupperware container, depending on like how pungent that food is and how um, how good your Tupperware container is, it could end up causing the rest of the fridge to stink and stuff like that, right? And it's because there's diffusion even through, you know, containers and stuff. Um, you know, especially if you just cover it with saran wrap, it's also more likely to leak out or things like that. Okay, so anyway, we can represent this with like two urns um, labeled A and B that contain a total number of N balls or molecules. Okay, and a, at each step, a ball is chosen uh, out of the N total balls at random, and you just move it from one to the other. Okay, one from one side to the other, or from this side to this side. So wh wherever ball you pick, you just pick one and you just have it swap. Um, swap urns, okay? And so you can think of this as just molecules moving through some kind of um, membrane, okay? Assuming, you know, if you could slow down time enough, you can just see one molecule at a time moving through. Okay, and then so we're gonna just say X sub N denotes the number of balls in urn A at step N, okay? So X at time N is just gonna be the number of balls. And so if we have a total of big N, big N, then the total possible values for this variable for the number of balls in urn A is gonna be anywhere from zero to N, okay? You can't have more than big N uh, balls in urn A and you can't have fewer than zero, okay? So this, is, this represents the state space. Um, and so we've got the sequence, X at time zero, X at time one, X at time two, all the way up to X at time little n with a state space going from zero up through big N. Sorry, I've got two Ns and one is big and one is little. All right, so um, if there are I balls, okay, at urn a, in urn A at step N, okay, so we're gonna say X at time N is equal to I. So let's say I is two or I is three or I is 17, whatever it is, okay. So let's say I is two, then at the next step, okay, only there's only two things that could happen. Either a ball from urn A gets taken and moved to urn B, or a ball from urn B gets taken and moved to urn A, okay? So if you have two balls in urn A, at the next step, you're either gonna end up with one or you're gonna end up with three, okay? You, um, because at every step, something is being moved, so and it's being moved one at a time. So you can't end up with two. If you're currently at two, you can't end up at two in the next step. 
and you can't, if you're currently at two, you can't end up at four or you can't end up at zero. Okay, you're either going to end up at one or end up at three. So, so if you're currently, if, if I is how many balls you have in earn A, if a ball gets chosen from A, then at the next step, you're going to have I minus one balls in A. Okay, you're going to go from two down to one. And if the ball is chosen from earn B, okay, at the next step, you're going to end up with three balls, I plus one. Okay, so if you currently have two in A, either a ball is going to move away and you're down to one, or a ball is going to move in and you're going to end up with three. Okay, so and then because there's a total of n balls in the um, in the whole system, um, and and all of these balls have the same probability, the probability that a ball gets chosen from a particular urn is just going to be proportional to the balls that are in the urn. Okay, I got a couple of diagrams to kind of illustrate this, and then we'll go back to the thing. Okay, um, oh, this is a, this is a mistake. There should be two balls. Okay, I got to redraw this. There should be two and two. Okay. There's a total of n equal to four. What happened to my picture? I'm missing stuff. Okay. This is correct. This one's not. Okay. All right. So anyway, um, this is, I apologize. There should be uh, two, two dots here and two dots here. And x at time n is two. Something happened when I saved my picture. Okay. So there's, there's four possible things that could happen. Okay. Uh, this ball gets chosen and it get, moves to earn B. Okay, and so we're going to end up with one and three. This ball gets chosen and it moves to earn B and we get one and three. Or uh, this ball gets chosen and it moves to earn A. And so we get three and one. Or this ball gets chosen and it moves to earn A and we get three and one. Okay, so these are because there's a total of four, four balls. So we have four possible things that can get chosen and moved over. And out of those four, two of them end up with A having one ball, and two of them end up with A having three balls. Okay, So the transition probability of going from two to one is 0.5, two out of four. And the transition probability of going from two to three is 0.5. Okay. Is that OK for this, uh, this diagram? OK. Um, Let's say you have three balls in uh, urn A at time uh, time n. Okay, so this is our diagram. We've got three in A and one in B. Okay, because we have a total of n equal to four balls. Okay, and so again, just one of these random one of these balls at random will get selected. Okay, and so it could be this ball that moves over, could be this ball or this ball that moves over, or it could be the ball over here that gets moved over. Okay, and so if we look at that. All of the ones where the one from A gets chosen will end up with two and two, two and two, two and two. And then this one will end up with four and zero, okay, if we choose this one over here. So if we look at the transition probability of going from starting with three balls and ending up with two balls, so probability of three to two, starting with three, ending up at two, that's three out of the four possible states. So that's going to be 0.75 or three fourths. And then one out of the four will start at three and end up with four. Okay, A started with three balls and ends up with four balls. And so that happens with a probability of one out of four. All right, is that okay? And so you kind of apply this, all right? So here there's a total of, we've got a five by five matrix because A can have anywhere zero, one, two, three, or four and can, uh, I guess, in the, the next transition, the, the state space, you know, could end up with 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4. And so our transition matrix uh, looks like this, right? So uh, we, we figured out basically these two rows here, that if you start off with 2, you can end up with 3 in the next state or 1 in the next state. So probability 2, 1, and probability 2, 3 is 1 half and 1 half. And if you start off with three, you can end up in two in the next state with probability three fourths, or you could end up with four in the next state with probability um, one fourth. Okay, and then if you kind of apply the same logic to any of the other states, you're you're going to end up with you know, um, if you start off with one ball, one fourth chance of going down to zero, and a three fourths chance of ending up with two in the next state. If you start off with zero balls, then in the next state you must end up with one ball, okay? Because uh, all basically, if you start up with zero balls in A, all the balls are over in B, 
And so no matter which one gets picked, it's going to come over from B to A. And so you got a 100% probability of ending up with one ball. And similarly, if, um, if you um, start off with all four balls in, uh, in state A, then in the next state, you're definitely going down to three. Okay, so this is going to end up being the transition matrix. Is that all right uh, for how this works? Okay, and this is uh, kind of your uh, state diagram, transition um, state diagram picture. All right, and so this, uh, and so this shows the transition probabilities of moving from one state to another. Don't think of this as like balls moving from one to another, okay? So it's, if you're currently at two, you've got a one half probability of ending up at three and you've got a one half probability of ending up at one, okay? It's not that they don't correspond to this, this image. It corresponds to this probability diagram here, okay? Now, right now, there's only two values in each row like these rows only have two non-zero values. So, so these, um, e these nodes only have kind of two arrows leading, leaving it, okay? Number four has only one value in that row that's non-zero, so it, it goes here, okay? But, you know, technically, if you had a different kind of setup, you could, you know, if like two balls could get transitioned or something, you might have um, more than one more than one arrow or something. Okay, and so more generally, um, for any kind of larger state space thing, okay, if you have uh, n balls, not just limited to four, the transition probabilities would be to start off, if you're currently at state i, you can end up with i minus one if basically one of your n balls gets selected, okay, one, or one of the i balls in urn a gets selected, you would end up with a I minus one with probability I over N. And then um, if one of the other balls, uh, a ball from urn B gets selected, you're gonna end up with I plus, plus one and that's gonna happen with probability one over I mi one minus I over N, okay? And then all other probabilities are zero. All of the transition probabilities are zero, okay? And then, so if you fill out your, your matrix, it's gonna look like this. To go from I to J, probability i over n for j equal to i minus one, and then um, one, one minus i over n for j equal to i plus one and zero everywhere else. So that's what we've got for the, uh, this earn model. Okay, and then, um, and then we also, I'll go through this quickly, I think this is fine. Okay, so there's also um, a random walk. This is also kind of, Oh my goodness, I forgot about quiz answers too. <laughs> all right, uh, let me give you, I'll I just give you all three of them. Okay, the answers are D, C, and A, like Disney California Adventure, but um, uh, D as in dog, C as in cat, A as in apple, okay? D, C, A, all right? D as in dog, C as in cat, A as in apple. Oh, I messed up my formatting here. Okay, this should have been a bulleted list. Um, all right, so random walk is, um, can be used to model kind of the, um, model the path of a particle or whatever as it moves through space. So you've got like Brownian motion, which is uh, often considered like how um, particles move in like liquid and stuff. Um, you can think of like uh, an insect moving around can be treated as a random walk, okay? Um, how much money um, a gambler wins or loses is a random walk. You got stock prices, maybe also a random walk, okay? So we're just going to look at like one-dimensional random walks, which will be um, uh, whether a gambler, like stock prices or gamblers win, wins or losses, okay? Mm -hmm. And so you've got x at time zero, time one, time two, through x at time n, and then um, and we are going to define them on the integers, okay? And we're going to start our random walks at zero, 
And at each step, either it goes up a unit or down a unit, okay? It either goes up one or it goes down one, okay? And it moves to the right with probability P and it moves to the left or it goes down one with probability one minus P or we, we will call that Q, okay? So we've got probabilities P and Q where P and Q add up to one. Okay, so if you're at time zero, if, you're, if you have value zero at time zero, then X at time one is gonna be one with probability P or negative one with probability Q, okay? And if at some arbitrary time, time N, you're currently at value I, then at time N plus one, you're either gonna be at I plus one or I minus one, okay? And so the, um, the transition probabilities to go from I to J is gonna be um, when J is I plus one, that happens with probability P. When J is I minus one, that happens with probability Q and everything else is zero. So that's, um, that's the random walk here, okay? And this is unbounded because technically you could end up at positive and, you know, move towards positive infinity given a long enough time. Could happen. Okay, uh, this random walk can also be expressed as the sum of IID random variables where you just say, um, if you take random variables Y, Y can take on the value one with probability P and minus one with probability Q. Um, and the Markov chain is just gonna be basically um, start off at zero and then you just add one or negative one where y is basically a sequence of independent values, right? So y is going to be independently drawn one and negative one, but then the sequence of x's won't be independent because they depend on the previous value. So the next x is your current value plus whatever y you drew at time n. Okay, and so, you know, this is if I want to execute this in R, it's super simple. Here's, we're just going to do a thousand steps, P with probability 0.5, Q with 0.5. I'm going to just sample Y um, from either one or negative one with probabilities P and Q with replacement. And then X is going to be the cumulative sum of all the Y's that I've drawn, starting at zero. And so there's one random walk where I start off at zero and Looks like I, you know, sometimes I go down, sometimes I go up. So this is what we've got. Here's another random walk where I start off at zero. I go up and down and stuff like that. And so you can see how some might want to use something like this to model like your day-to-day -day stock prices and things like that, right? So obviously there's there's things that happen when people, when earnings reports come out and stuff like that, but just kind of on a day-to-day -day basis, like, This could look like maybe how, how a stock behaves and stuff. Okay, anyway, um, that's it for today. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll end here. I posted homework three that um, that's up in uh, week five that covers all random number generation. And then, um, yeah, we'll, we'll see more Markov chain stuff. All right, have a good day and we'll see you guys on Wednesday.